uh, because AAM and CAVs are becoming increasingly more available, uh, there's a lot of considerations for airport managers, uh, both on the ground and up in the air. So I'm going to turn it to Jared Esselman, UDOT's Aeronautics Director, to facilitate the next session. Thank you, Muriel. And I feel like I'm just jumping in from one place to the other here. So uh, let's get started. This panel is uh, with several uh, airport managers, and I'll introduce them momentarily, um, because they are today's air experts on where multi -mode, two modes of transportation really come together, and sometimes even three and four modes of transportation come together specifically where the land meets the air. Um, so today on our panel, we have Andy Solsvig. He is the director at Canyonlands Field Airport in Moab, Utah. Andy has worked at a variety of airports in several different capacities for the past 20 years. His responsibilities and experience include a broad knowledge and understanding of airport operations, planning, marketing, air service, operations, budgetary, and administrative skill sets. So we're excited to hear from Andy. We're also going to have Nick Holt. Nick is the airport manager at Cedar City Regional Airport. Nick has worked both in the private sector as well in the government sector and has been involved in the aviation industry since 2003. He currently holds a bachelor's degree in aviation science and two accreditations through the American Association of Airport Executives. He has experience working at two federally certified airports St. George Regional Airport and City Cedar City Regional Airport. He has owned and operated his own business and managed an aircraft leasing and commercial real estate company. Currently, he is directly responsible for all aspects involved in operating the third busiest airport in the state of Utah based on yearly operational counts. So we're excited to, uh, to hear from Nick as well. And then finally, we have Bryant Garrett, who is the airport manager at Ogden Hinkley Airport. Uh, Bryant is responsible for the administration, planning, and development of, of operations at Ogden. It is Utah's busiest municipal airport for private aircraft. Prior to joining Ogden, uh, Bryant was the airport manager for the city of Redding, California, where he was responsible for the operations, finance, and management of the two city-owned airports, Redding Municipal and Benton Air Park. Bryant has also worked for the Sanford Airport Authority and the Salt Lake City Airport Authority. So gentlemen, welcome. And uh, let's, let's uh, I'm going to ask Andy, Nick, Bryant, do you have presentations you want to show or do we want to do this more conversationally? There are some slides that we all have, I believe, but um, Perfect. conversation is fine too. So it's however you want to approach it. Well, let's start off with your slides, Andy. Let's go with you. Let's, let's, let's <laughs> hit it off with you and have you show your slides. Okay, we'll go ahead. Um, give me one second to share my screen. And this. Everybody see that? Yep. Okay, um, here we go. Clean it up here. Okay, again, uh, the introduction's already been made. Thank you. So managing capacity, we uh, as airport directors are in charge of the, the grounds and the facilities in respect to the ownership of uh, you know, whatever municipality or authority, what have you. And what we work with is through master planning, um, airside and land, land side usage, as well as our airport layout plan and, and preparing and planning for the long-term needs of what um, we think is coming, uh, demand-based, as, as well as the infrastructure. So when this assignment was given to us or uh, volunteered, took a closer look at what, what does this really look like and how do we manage the capacity and balance everything together of uh, what might be coming down the road. And so the first thing we do especially with master plans, looking at our own infrastructure needs, what kind of parking is needed, the pads, safety areas, um, any electrical needs, if we, we are going to go fully electrical or some sort of hybrid, what fueling needs, um, you know, are there more alternative fueling options there available? Um, are tanks going to be needed for that? What kind of weight bearing capacity is needed? as well as the security. And I bring up security because is it going to be air side or is it land side? Um, if you look at the, the Ubers and Lyfts of the world, um, they found a way to 
kind of mingle with the, the taxis and shuttles in a different way. And so is that something similar that would happen here? Uh, what kind of space needs are, are gonna be required? And, and then again, how is it paid for? Who's going to pay for that infrastructure? Um, and then the revenue, which has been, uh, will be touched on here shortly in another presentation. So what you see on the, the diagram is what we have here in Moab for at least our terminal area and the hangar area. And, excuse me, hearing some radio stuff. Um, of what we expect for some future development. And for some reason, it doesn't really show on here, but there are helipads that we think would be similar type of use. Um, however, the proximity to where the gate and the fence line or even terminal is, is too far. So we would want to look at where is it convenient for people to access, and maybe it's a different location altogether. And what it might look like, again, this would be more of a land side. We have, we don't have a whole lot of infrastructure here in Moab, um, but we are growing. And this is our current long-term and short-term parking lots. And so one option was if it was land side, kind of takes away some of these other concerns, but this would be an area where you could use, people could park or they land, let's say they flew in, landed, grabbed their luggage, and now, since Moab is 17 miles away, one option, if they're going into town or to a, um, a ranch of some sort or um, some of these retreat areas, they could hop onto one of these mobile vehicles and just fly there, which would be um, pretty convenient for folks. So uh, some considerations, again, we consider like a helipad. Um, is it solar powered? Obviously there's been a lot of talk about energy needs and we're already in discussions about what a solar farm to help uh, sustainability for this airport. And what do those future needs look like? So maybe we would want to ramp up solar power in order to have the charging stations, whether it's for cars or these um, uh, uh, mobile units. Uh, personal, you know, what, what are we gonna look at? What are we gonna see? Are they gonna be more personal or a shuttle type or something different altogether? And then how would it operate? Uh, this, this map shows a little bit more. So you can see right here what we had on the previous diagram. And then I mentioned some of these heliports that we are planning for the future because we are seeing more helicopter activity here as well. And so it depends on which side of the fence it's going to go on, or maybe it is both. So um, I would be curious more about the security requirements if there are even any. Uh, as they are pretty strict with commercial operators right now. Um, do they fly in and use the airspace just like a helicopter or a plane? Or is it something different? And how does that roll into our current patterns? And then again, depends on personal use. So um, one idea that we had interesting is we do have a train route that goes right by the airport. And so maybe it's a consideration of looking at, do you combine train with parking with um, this type of use in a, a different area altogether. And that way it's out of the airspace or out of the way from um, existing conditions. So though I just wanted to short and sweet to open it up more for dialogue, but that's the presentation. Fantastic, thank you, Andy. See, this is exactly why I wanted airport managers because you truly are the experts on multimodal connectivity right? Not only is it the airspace and the land side and, and how do those two move together, but then you go in and throw in trains at Moab Airport. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you, Andy. I appreciate it. Well, Nick, let's move on to you. Um, do you have a presentation for us as well? I'll let you start screen sharing. I do. Let's get that started. Absolutely. Uh, you can see that uh, full screen. Um, still, I see you. Oh, here we go. Your screen sharing now. Yes, we can see your presentation there. All right, so good morning. I'm thrilled to be here. I've, uh, I, I was able to listen to all the, the presentations yesterday and, and through this morning. And it, this is an exciting time to be, to be a part of uh, advanced air mobility. Um, I don't claim to be a, an expert at advanced air mobility, um, but I do have 18 years of experience in aviation. And over the last 10 years, I've been involved in managing airports, airport security, 
and also aircraft rescue fire. I have a commercial pilot's license and I have experience with flight training and aircraft ownership and leasing contracts. Jared, how do I get to my next slide? I'm sorry. Use my arrow keys and it's not working. Um, if you're on your computer, Nick, uh, try clicking one of the arrows on your presentation. Oh, there you go. You got it. That works. Okay. Uh, so one of my roles here in management at Cedar City Airport has allowed me to directly work with Iron County Tourism and also the Cedar City Economic Development. Um, and I can definitely see EV toll aircraft being a viable use here in Cedar City. Um, it is, uh, Cedar City is known for its festivals and events. And, and I've met people visiting from the Shakespeare Festival as well as other events from all areas within the world, Asia, Europe, Spain, Italy, New York, and several other locations nationally and abroad. So at first glance at this, this slide, um, you may only see a road map in front of you, but what I want to focus on is Cedar City's geographic location and what we have around Cedar City. Um, Cedar City, uh, Cedar City's a small community. We're about 60,000 people um, here locally. So when you first think about, when I first heard about urban air mobility, you know, I thought, oh, this is just going to be tailored to the, the bigger cities. But as I've been doing some research and, and looking at what's built around us, I can really see an, a couple of opportunities that uh, advanced air mobility can take advantage of here in Cedar City. I can see a, a location here at the airport where people fly in commercially, they, they're able to access a, an air taxi and go, up, go and access our downtown location. Um, that would allow people to, to also access the Shakespeare venue. Um, it's near our downtown location. From there, I'm looking out at a kind of a broader aspect for our, our tourism. Um, you can see down towards the bottom of the map that in orange, we've got Zion National Park. It's uh, located near us. Uh, further to the east is Bryce Canyon National Park. We've also got Cedar Breaks National Monument. Um, all those locations I can see uh, EV toll being a way to, to be able to transport uh, people and visitors out to those parks. One of the things I wanted to point out with National uh, or Zion National Park is they have limited parking there and they've already restricted the the vehicle access through the park. So you have to drive to the park, you have to park in a parking lot, then you have to either get on a, a shuttle bus, uh, rent a bike or, or walk into the park. And so uh, utilizing uh, EV toll aircraft to, to not only shuttle people to the park, but possibly even using it as an air tour uh, within the park. I can also see both the, the local community and also the, the visitors of Cedar City using EV toll to, as transportation to get to Brian Head Ski Resort and also the mountain bike park. So this is another use that we could use EV toll year round. Um, so I I can, I can see EV toll charters flying out of our FBO or even eventually certified commercial EV toll flights with direct access to secured area in the terminal, allowing public to access additional flights to the south of us to St. George and also to Las Vegas McCarran International Airport. Uh, this is where most of our leakage is happening here in Cedar City. So I think this is definitely a use that could be used here in, in Southern Utah. On this slide, I want to talk a little bit about our airport here in Cedar City. Um, we're a 139 airport. We're an uncontrolled airspace. Jared talked a little bit about controlled airspace and uncontrolled airspace in his presentation. 
Um, we're in uncontrolled airspace. So what that means is uh, pilots are communicating with themselves over a CTAP frequency. Um, this is important for, for many safety reasons. And, and so when I hear about the EV toll eventually going to be being unmanned, my mind goes to, well, how is that aircraft going to communicate its position? Um, I know that we've come a long ways with technology, and so I'm sure that uh, the industry will figure out a way to communicate. Um, so here in Cedar City, we have a, a diverse fleet of aircraft that uh, use our runway and access our airport. Uh, we we got our helicopter flight school. Uh, it's the busiest helicopter flight school in the nation, and they offer fixed wing training as well. We see corporate jet tra traffic on a daily basis, and we also have an active wildland fire tanker base that fly both helicopters and heavy aircraft, such as new 737 air tankers. It's not uncom uncommon for various military aircraft to frequent our airport. Mix, mixing these training aircraft with various other aircraft, we've learned that communication is the key to safety. We've also taken steps further to work with the local helicopter traffic to operate on the east side of the airport where the helipads are located. And the fixed wing traffic flies the traffic pattern to the west side of the runway. As advanced air mobility is added to the fleet mix, we may need to look at adding arrival and departure procedures as well as minimum and maximum operating heights over the city, depending on frequency of their flights. Um, again, these aircraft will need to be communicating with each other over the traffic, uh, on the traffic advisory frequency. So when we're talking about the layout or the structure of the airport, um, wanted to focus a little bit on how we manage the airport structure, uh, how we control the traffic coming into it, both uh, commercial traffic, but also how the, the airports and aircraft are, are controlled on the airport. So we, when we do that, we, we break our airport down into two parts. Uh, the first one is the land side. Land side consists of ground transfer, transportation, terminal parking, commercial airline ticketing, baggage checks, baggage claims, car rentals, basically the front side of the, the terminal. Um, we do that because there's, there's certain regulations that it seems to be an in industry that it's a little less restrictive on the, the land side versus when you start getting into the air side of things. So. When we, we switch over and we talk about the air side, um, if you're traveling out on, on vacation, you've already got your ticket, you've checked your bags, now you're walking through. The air side starts when you, you enter the TSA checkpoint. Everything beyond that is going to be considered the air side. So that includes your sterile areas, your hold rooms, um, your secured ramps for the commercial aircraft when they, they park to, to pick up passengers. Um, and and it goes beyond everything inside the fence. When we then we can take it a step further and say, okay, we're going to split the air side down into two different parts. We've got our movement areas, uh, which consist of our runways and our taxiways, and then our non-movement areas include the aircraft aprons, vehicle access roads, teller ramps, and eventually it's going to be our our verticals. The, that are contained within inside the, the fence of the airport. Um, the reason why I, I bring this up is because uh, the way that our EV toll is going to be used uh, is going to determine what regulations that they're going to have to follow, what certifications that they're going to have to get. And it also uh, affects the regulations that the airports have of where these are going to be placed at. We're, uh, so, so we're going to get into to implementing and, and managing vertiports, whether that's inside the fence or outside the fence of the airport. Uh, 
um, when we when we do that, we want to take a look at charging base stations. Um, that's going to have an impact on on where we locate these bird ports on our airports. Uh, we also are going to need overnight hangars and maintenance facilities. Uh, my my mind when we talk about bird ports and and setting them up is. Uh, we really should be modeling the, the vertiports after our airports and our airport terminals. So I envision that there would be a, a ticketing and a passenger boarding. Um, what that does is it channels, uh, channels all of your passengers down to where they have a specific point to, to access that aircraft. Um, and then the other consideration when, when managing a vertical port is, or, or coming up with the design of it is safety. So we wanna make sure that, uh, that it's fenced, it's uh, paved or concrete to support the aircraft and that we don't have kids or children or, or people with ill intentions coming and throwing stuff up into the blades. We, we wanna make sure that the people that are getting on these, these EV toll aircraft are, are safe, especially as we start to roll this out um, in the beginning. That's uh, making sure that our communities and, and the public has a, a view that this is safe is really important. And then last, we need to look at the traffic pattern altitude. Um, currently, your typical traffic pattern altitude for other aircraft entering the airport is 1,000 feet above the airfield or runway elevation. Um, and so are we taking these aircraft directly straight up in, into that space um, or is that gonna be located away from it? Um, and so those are things that we wanna take into consideration as well. So no matter if the if the VTOL uh, vertiports are, are located on the airport or off the airport, uh, we really need to start looking at uh, who's going to be involved. So airport management, you can see as we go through these discourses that airport management needs to be involved, uh, especially if these vertiports are, are supposed to be uh, starting out at airports. Uh, we need to include our airport planning consultants. And um, I know that this was mentioned in yesterday's, yesterday's presentation, and I agree with it 100% that, that now is the time to start planning for this. Um, from my, my airport manager standpoint uh, or experience, with working with the city level, it would be easier to start this planning process if, if our city and local governments, uh, if we had the investment groups and the ma manufacturing companies coming to us to help us show that there is a need or a demand for these new improvements to begin individual, uh, to begin individuals that need to be included in this planning, planning process included our airport management, our airport planning consultants, FA planners out of the FA airport district office, state planners out of the state aeronautics office, and also our city and county planners. The building department officials and the city and engineers should also be included. Other things to consider in the planning efforts include airport master plans, uh, the airport layout plan, city and county zoning ordinances, and the city master plan. Without updating these documents or uh, starting the planning process, we will not move forward. So this slide shows uh, some of the regulations that I'm aware of that may be affected depending on the types of use uh, when it comes to EV toll aircraft. So we need to take those into consideration in our planning process as well. Uh, and this, this map is a map that our, our city uses for planning process. So it's the county, city and county zoning map. You'll notice that our, we've got our airport overlay over top of the city, and then all the different colors are different zoning ordinances 
that that are used here. So if we go in and we, we try to change the zones uh, that they've already have that parcel zoned as so that we can get the permitting and licensing that we need to install vertiports in our cities. Um, this sometimes can take years to, to convince the, that there is a need and then also work through the elected officials to, to get this change voted in. Um, so again, planning is, is number one. We've got our, on this slide, I wanted to bring up that uh, as an airport manager, we have the airport layout plan, uh, airport master plan and the capital improvement plan. You can see our capital improvement plan for the airport already goes through 2030. Um, before this conference and before the research that I've been doing, it's this hasn't been on our radar. And so really we need to start looking at these. Um, once we, we get the airport layout plan updated and there's locations designated on the airport, um, then we can look at adding these to our capital improvement plans. Um, without it on our capital improvement plan, there's not a very good chance of, of receiving funding to, to be able to move forward and build these, these structures. So you can see all the different colors on this map are different years of projects that we have out in front of us. And so I would love to see here in the future um, a vertiport listed on our capital improvement plan. And that's all I have for you today. Fantastic. Thank you, Nick. I appreciate it. You brought up a lot of good uh, points and concepts that everybody needs to think about. Um, Brian, let's go over to you. What have you got for us this morning? Well, thank you for the uh, welcome, Jared. And uh, give me a second. I'll get my uh, uh, screen shared. All right, can everybody see that one? Yes, sir, we can see it. All right, then. If I can just get my version of it popped up here. All right. So the Ogden Airport's a little bit different than both Cedar City and uh, Moab, and namely it's because we have uh, essentially urban creep that has uh, encroached around the airport. So. Um, it's, it's, it's real tight and land is a premium. So we kind of go off of, uh, to start with my view of what the next generation travel is going to be. And I, I, I use something that already exists and that's the airline hub and spoke system. So I'm looking at, uh, small hops with the airport essentially being the, uh, the hub. And so the spokes would go out to any of the destinations that are nearest and they would also feed in, but it would be a transfer point for uh, intermodal change. So what we're looking at is small, uh, relatively small. I saw from um, Jared's presentation, now they're going all the way up to the uh, large air carrier aircraft, but for the uh, immediate future, we're looking at the smaller, maybe most six to eight passenger aircraft that would come in and what I call Air Uber, I guess it's actually called Uber Elevate and the company actually does exist. But these will feed in as a uh, Ogden as a destination and then for transfer for both rail and uh, to uh, ground transportation, whether that's private vehicle or taxis or the actual Ubers and lifts of the world. Okay, and this can be a hub that would operate as either four persons or four cargo. It, uh, it would work uh, essentially the same. The only big difference would be is that if it were cargo, you'd need additional infrastructure because there's gotta be, unlike uh, uh, the Ogden Airport now where we have air carrier traffic and I have a system for getting people from aircraft onto uh, other modes of transportation, we do not have a distribution center for uh, cargo. And that would serve the same purpose for the cargo as opposed to passengers. Some assumptions are going to be made um, having to do with the size of aircraft and the uh, wingspans. 
Uh, we're assuming that uh, VTOL is the way of the future where you're not going to need the large approaches coming down to the traditional runways. You're going to be able to come in and vector into a landing point. Uh, the weight distribution on the pavement, uh, weight is a huge issue for the vertical uh, lift type aircraft. So I feel like everything that we have for our current design is going to be adequate for the future as well. Let's see, um, Ogden Airport is a towered field, uh, one of three in the state, and it is a 139 airport accepting air carrier traffic. We're bound by FAR 139 and also by uh, Code of Federal Regulations 1542 for our friends over there with TSA. All right, I put a big picture up here so you can see where the only really undeveloped area on the east side of the airport where I have the power, I have the water, the sewer, and everything else I need is available. So big arrow shows exactly where it is and it gives you the idea of the encroachment that has come into the Ogden airport. Um, we're only on 720 acres and we're hemmed in with the city of Roy, West Haven, and Ogden itself, and a little bit of Riverside too. So with this undeveloped space here, what we've done is through the master plan, I've kind of chosen to uh, use the things that exist right now that we know there's a demand for, and then try to put in the things that are not so obvious uh, for our future. Now, Ogden, a lot of times you say, well, you know, in the future, just like the airlines have choices and uh, people that own aircraft have choices as to what airport they want to go to. Um, Ogden, it's about the three most important things in real estate is location, location, location. So I point out our proximity to Salt Lake City. We're within a 50 mile radius, our outdoor recreation, both the uh, camping, the boating, and the uh, three ski resorts that we have right up above us, as well as reasonable proximity to those that are up above uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, we have a revitalized downtown Ogden area. And one of the big needs we have right now is even though we're very, very close, we're only about three miles from downtown, where there's a big issue with trying to get people that have dwell time to get them out of the airport and get them downtown where they'll spend some money. I also want to point out that there's a pretty good employment base. And as Ogden gets bigger and bigger, which is inevitable, I left the Salt Lake area 20 years ago in 1999 and came back in 2019. And in 20 years, I cannot believe the amount of growth and I cannot stand the huge amount of traffic. And I'm hoping that VTOL and some other options will help that traffic as uh, somebody had alluded to earlier about getting those uh, uh, vehicles off the street and replacing them with multiple uh, occupant uh, uh, aircraft. Uh, our proximity to Hill Air Force Base one, makes the uh, airspace a little complicated. We have an overhead corridor that goes into Salt Lake International as a large uh, hub uh, airport uh, with about three to 400,000 annual operations. Uh, right next to us is Hill Air Force Base. Um, from the end of one of my runways to the end of the runway at Hill Air Force Base is roughly three miles. We also have a major employer as well as a large uh, education or um, uh, university uh, with Weber State uh, University. We have close proximity in Roy to a front runner station, which is also uh, ends its line right now in Ogden. Uh, Interstate 15 grows right next to the airport and within a relatively short uh, distance, probably about 35 miles intersects with Interstate 80. Kind of the pitfalls and obstacles like any infrastructure is funding. We've got to come up with funding and there are mechanisms in place right now that uh, could be altered to accept uh, VTOL projects. And those could be the uh, airport improvement program, which most of us get our money from, uh, the state of Utah and provide grants, uh, which we have been a recent recipient of to uh, develop the infrastructure on the opposite side of our field. But right now we're kind of focusing on the other side that's ready to go right now. Um, loans, private sector investment, the private public partnerships, uh, revenue bonds, et cetera, the different types of options you'd have there. And each one of them has their own problems that uh, 
could prevent it, and in particular, the revenue bonds, because you've got to convince the banks that the revenue is stable enough to go for a 20, say, 20 year bond. Opportunity cost needs to always be considered because when we put in large facilities like this, what are we giving up? We're giving up land. We're focusing our funding, which is scarce, on one particular aspect, and we're giving up airspace because all of these have a finite amount of uh, uh, capacity. Uh, the airspace, the runways, the taxiways, the land, they all have limitations. This is just a throw in there because I actually am old enough to have owned an eight track tape uh, from cassettes to um, the DVDs and uh, who knows what tomorrow is, but these are some of the losers in the past. Some of them were successful. It's like you look at the Sony Walkman there. It was successful, made money for Sony, but it's now obsolete. So like the dinosaurs, airports have to be able to adapt. Okay, so this is on my uh, master plan and my ALP. And what we're looking at is the future in that area that's undeveloped. You can kind of see the land underneath it, but these are nine position to start off with helicopter parking aprons. And they're configured for a 60 foot, which is a pretty large diameter uh, rotor. But these will also lend themselves just fine for a vertical takeoff and landing and parking. Uh, because there are only nine of them, they would be considered uh, not so much parking as a um, di disembarking or a embarking location where you get people on it. I put it in close proximity to our FBOs because essentially with small aircraft and operating inside the fence, you would end up with a TSA rule doesn't really kick in for smaller aircraft and they can drop in at that location and get their access to land side directly through the FBO. Okay, for every airport out there, uh, fueling is a big issue. And what happens when we no longer fuel with uh, petroleum products? What happens to our FBOs? What happens to the infrastructure that's been allocated right now for tanks and uh, disbursement and the, and the trucks? All that infrastructure becomes in question and essentially becomes again part of the dinosaurs. Um, I've chosen to look at the uh, electric as being our future. And today I want to use the electric for the 400 megahertz power so I don't have to have a GPU, which is loud and obnoxious, as well as the APUs in the aircraft, they can have nice quiet connection directly to a large power source. And in the future, we can use that same facility for, um, for our uh, future charging stations. So this is what in rough concept we're looking at. The area right here where these four boxes are in line, each one of those boxes is set apart far enough that I can park large aircraft there, open the uh, uh, aircraft rated covers, which will handle up to 300,000 pounds. And inside you have a connection point where you can get 400 megahertz power. So this allows the aircraft to operate there. The proximity to my terminal building is not accidental. We have taken and beefed up the pavement from that yellow line out to the movement area, also for 300,000 pounds. So I can put a line of aircraft there and could extend my CIDA area out there. And it can be either for aircraft or it can be for charters or it can be for just strictly large aircraft general aviation. Right now, that same area, as if you look real close, you can see is set up for tie downs. So the area gets used, it's just versatile in its uh, ability to be used. Being as we are a transfer point for intermodal, I've also got to have uh, land for parking. Now this over here is our current parking lot for our airlines, which has about 300 uh, parking stalls. And with my current level of activity, which is between um, maybe six to 12 flights a week. Um, I'm at probably 75 to 80% capacity at a maximum, even on my holidays. But right now I don't, I only have a single uh, car rental 
And so that gets capacity issues there where, where am I gonna have a QTA, a quick turnaround for the uh, car rentals? Where am I going to be able to park lots of aircraft for the holiday seasons where we get a lot of demand for that? Uh, so the idea here was to integrate what would be a future FBO, and these would be the aircraft storage, and all of these other areas. These buildings here are all at end of life and will be likely to be torn down soon. So we get a large area of parking that is reasonable walking distance from the terminal because of the cost of operating a shuttle purse, uh, uh, project and the revenue you get from parking. That would be my preference that we keep this within walking distance. Okay, and then the big one for me, can we make money with this? So these are the revenue opportunities. We can look at those uh, providers uh, such as Uber and treat them like the car rentals and the taxi services where we can get a percentage of their gross profits or a per use basis, either, either one would work. Where we used to sell fuel, if we're no longer, then we're gonna be selling uh, as a disbursement for a uh, charging service for electric. And we're going to be uh, charging for our employees that would be providing that as long as, as well as the ground handling. Uh, landing fees, parking fees, and re remain overnight fees were also optional. Um, as a general rule, it's difficult for me as an airport manager to charge um, aircraft land uh, that weigh less than 12,500 pounds because from an engineering perspective, they can pretty much land on your runways and taxiways all day, all night, 24 seven, 365. And they'll virtually, it'll, the sun will make it wear out if they will. So a lot of these, I believe the smaller ones, I would have to consider the same way, but when they have to have specific purposes, I like having user fees so that the people that use them and get the benefit are the ones that are paying for it. We're gonna have a whole new level of flight instruction as we get into it, uh, uh, because we can have piloted vehicles where there's a human pilot on board. We can have remote piloted where a human's flying it, but the human's not in the aircraft. And we can have completely autonomous operations. Each one is gonna have a new level of instruction. And all of our uh, institutes of higher learning, uh, those specifically in aviation and uh, others for just in a technology basis need to be paying attention to that. Some of those facilities could be at the airport, but they do not necessarily have to have all of the uh, facilities there, but that some of them would, would, would need to be very similar to our current uh, flight instruction. We've got a whole new level of avionics and navigation um, airframe, power plants, mechanics, that all changes and you've got to be able to keep up with it. We're going to need those mechanics and hell, we're short on them now. Um, new manufacturing operations, you know, they're going to create these new aircraft. Hyundai is going to be somewhere and maybe that's at my airport in the future. Maybe that's the purpose of the west side of the, the uh, airport. So there are manufacturing facility opportunities. And last, I know mo nobody that pays them likes them. But passenger facility charges are a very real and very strong uh, way to finance your um, infrastructure through capital projects. All right. That pretty much concludes what I've got, Jared. And uh, I'll leave that up there for the end of it, just so uh, uh, you can see my contact information. Fantastic. Thank you, Brian. And I'm actually going to ask you to uh, end your screen sharing so that okay. we can jump into this all together. And while Brian's doing that, the first question I want to I want to throw out at you guys is, <clears throat> what as as airport managers, as people who plan and design and or at least oversee the planning and designing of that that point where air and land come together. What would you do right now to start planning for both connected autonomous vehicles on the land side of your airport and urban air mobility vehicles on the, on the, either on the land side or on the air side of your airport? What would, what would be your first steps? And the reason I ask each of you that is because your perspective is gonna be the same as the FAA perspective. And, and there are a lot of people who are working in this arena who have not worked with the FAA on the same type of thing before. So what is your first step as you start introducing this new mode of transportation to your airport? 
Do you care who leads off? Nope, I don't care who leads off. Why don't you take it away, Brian? Okay, well, just looking at it, uh, that was the whole philosophy of trying to morph uh, existing type infrastructure into what we need in the future, because right now that's eligible under AIP. So the apron that I'm proposing is possible under an AIP grant at this point. And if I can get uh, uh, a good perspective that it helps uh, the uh, passengers of the airport, then it's PFC eligible under the existing programs. And I'm sure there'll be a lot more in the future, but since we're looking at AIP and PFCs, then it's gonna start with our ACIP, our Airport Capital Improvement Program, and getting these things in there, because as most people know, if you think about it today, the fastest you're gonna get it funded is three years from now. I think that's a really right. good point, is, it, is it, the process is methodical and, and slow. And, um, you know, the first thing we have to do, look at our master plan, at the existing conditions, what kind of growth and forecast of growth are we going to have, and then what are the needs of the future, and then build that into our capital investment plan and have FAA review and approve it, depending on where it's located. So, again, yeah, three to five years minimum, so planning is critical. Yeah, and I'll jump in on that, too. I agree with what Andy and Brian have both said. Um, it really depends. You brought up two points, Jared. You brought up being out on the, the air side, but also on the land side. So the air side is definitely, you know, depending on the use, would be AFP eligible for federal funding. Um, one of the, the things that I look at when we go out on the land side is if we use federal funding out on the land side, say, like we, we improve a parking lot at a terminal with federal funding, we no longer can can charge a user fee, uh, charge a fee to, to collect uh, parking revenue. And so we would really wanna be careful how we approach that on the land side and what funding we use to, to build this infrastructure. So, as we talk about the different types of funding, uh, there's federal funding, there's state funding, there could even be private funding, right? Um, has what, what mechanisms exist for the airport to use private funding? And I'll, and I'll just put that out there as a really brief and concise uh, question. Um, just really brief and concise, what it, are there mechanisms for private funding? And if they're not mechanisms for the airport to use it, what about a vertiport? Well, the, um, the uh, acronym du jour, if you will, is PPP, and that's Private Public Partnership. And it's generally representing a government entity that doesn't have the money and has to essentially align with the people that have the money. And don't, the biggest danger I see there, at my airport in Florida, we had the terminals that were built with private sector money. We participated with state money as well, but they want to recoup their investment. And they're essentially looking for agreements the last 30 to 50 years. We're in a rapidly evolving industry. It doesn't fit real well. You've got to get uh, so that those long-term agreements are not straight jackets and they allow you to get that private sector money that you want. But on the other hand, they have to be they need to have relief points like every five years where you get to uh, keep the base agreement intact, but give the ability to look at what's changed. Okay. So I, I would add to that. Um, it really, you know, going through the, the CN course, certified manager course or AAA, you learn that uh, if you see one airport, you've seen one airport, meaning that airports are different. And so based on on how the airport structure is um, really defines what, what kind of funding you can go after. So like here in Cedar City, we are tied to the general fund of the city and we're underneath the city umbrella. So we, would, we could go to the city, the city if they chose to, could pull bonds and, and grants through the city to help support the airport as well as uh, the airport going after funding on, on their own through the state aeronautics or the FAA or revenues of that, that type. Um, I mean, go ahead, there Ed. is one other option, I think, and that that's a ground lease, no different than a hangar or 
um, in the apron space where maybe they pay for the infrastructure needs, but there's a lease to an extent, and then there's other charges associated with it. And that way the burden is less on the airport. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, let me ask, as y'all got into this, um, and I'm asking from the, you know, there, there's going to be a lot of urban airports, right? These little airports, vertiports that pop up in cities, maybe even in neighborhoods. When y'all first started managing airports, what were, a few, what were a few of the surprises you encountered that maybe you could help prepare future vertiports for? What were those surprises you, you said, oh, I didn't expect this? Well, I can look at, uh, I got into this industry in, in 1986 and shortly thereafter, I was at the Salt Lake Airport and they wanted to put in an instrument landing system, uh, a CAT uh, one approach, excuse me, a CAT three approach. And we were told by the FAA then that they were no longer funding instrument landing systems that within the next five years, there were going to be no ground-based equipment. It was all going to be GPS. How did that work out? Okay, so that's the surprise that I've found is that trying to go from concept to actual work and then trying to go from somebody's, you know, it, the nuts and bolts are a lot more difficult than people are making them. So, you know, I do see if you drive around certain affluent neighborhoods, you have people that have a helicopter landing spot in their backyard. There's one in Salt Lake up near the mouth of Little Cottonwood Canyon. Okay, but I don't see that happening everywhere. And so the idea is because of the cost and also the factors involving safety, I think you're going to have to have um, a more widely distributed system and not uh, congregated uh, multiple locations very close to each other. That's just my thoughts. Okay. Nick, Andy? You know, well, we, we have, have such a variety of experience in multiple airports. Having worked at six different airports, I will guarantee you each one is different, whether it's operations or space and capacity to environmental. Um, it's a complicated question because it's going to be unique to each airport. And I think you just have to take a look at that a little bit closer and, and what is going to apply, what's going to work and what's not going to work. And Jared, the, the question was that, uh, what were we surprised with when we, we stepped into management? Um, so one of the one of the things or the concepts that I thought prior to being an airport manager is that you've got the FAA, they're one FAA, um, they're all going to have the same same vision, and as we've gone through this runway reconstruction project, I've realized and worked with multiple departments within the FAA. Um, some have funding, some want to, to, and they're more willing to to go to bat for you and help you out. And then um, the other the other side of the FAA may be looking at the same project in a totally different angle, and so. Uh, knowing which department of the FAA that you're working with and kind of seeing it from, from their perspective and, and what they're looking at will really help you as you, you move forward to, to become certified or uh, make these improvements. Fantastic. All right. In our last three minutes, I want each of you to take 60 seconds. And I want you to give me your advice to a new airport manager or a new vertiport facility, how do you manage peak traffic hours and slump traffic hours, and what do you need to know for each? Well, like any other scarce resource, you see it at big airports where they've done a slot system. And to me, you're looking at pricing differential as possibly an incentive, so it's cheaper to fly in during the non-peak hours versus the peak hours. Um, there, there will come a time that no matter how hard you try, you're going to reach capacity. And um, so I think that probably needs to be identified first. And whether that's the people with PhD after their name or the PE that we all pay for from consultants. But the idea is you need to know what is Nirvana? What is that point where you can handle the, the absolute peak 
and then you can kind of build from there. But I like the incentives, you know, you try to get people to, based on your pricing, to react uh, the way you want them to do. And I would say that's a very strong tool for anybody in this business in the future. So I'll jump in next. I think that, uh, you know, it's important to network. Um, as an airport manager, you're not gonna know all aspects of, of what, what you need to implement. And, and so relying on your consultants, relying on the, the resources at the state aeronautics level and also at the airport district office with the FAA, um, rely on those resources. Look at your peak hours, look at uh, your slow times. Obviously we all wanna be as busy as we can. That's where we generate the most revenue. And so if you're slow, let's figure out why you're slow and, and increase that. that time. Andy? Uh, I would say pay attention to what's going on in the industry. This was a wonderful, um, I guess, webinar conference and it really has opened my eyes on what's going on. Uh, it's really impressive and how fast things are changing. So then the next step would be informing and educating our leaders in the community, specifically city or county planners and getting them involved on what it might look like and how it, um, I guess, participates or, or just is active in the community and what kind of impacts it's going to have. And then giving presentations to educate the public, uh, whether it's our role or another role or multiple people that educates the public because there is that community involvement and then thinking about the impacts to the airport from a planning perspective and looking ahead in the next five to 10 years, um, what the possibilities are. And so then how will these changes impact the industry as well as our operations? So a lot of things to think about. Fantastic, wow, thank you, fellas. So Andy, Nick, Bryant, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I hope everybody got a lot out of this. These guys really do handle the connection point between air and land today. And I think we're gonna be getting a lot of their advice as we try and do it moving forward. So with that, Muriel, I will hand it back to you.